Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Hawaii, if you didn't know it, the state of clean energy. Who are we? Well, the handsome young man at the bottom of the screen is Mitch, Mitch Ewan. He's my co-host on the show. And the pretty lady is Nina Wu. She is a reporter uh, for the Star Advertiser. And, uh, you know, I was telling her before the show is we all should really appreciate our reporters, especially our local reporters, so important to us. Welcome both of you guys to the show. Thank you. Aloha, Jay. Thanks. So we have a two-part show, um, Nina. One, one part is energy and especially electric vehicles, which you wrote about recently, um, and because that's part of your beat. And uh, can you summarize your article? It was it was a little bit of a dismay because uh, it sounds like uh, although we we talk the talk, we don't walk the walk. What do you think? Right, right. Well, uh, for a lot of the EV owners out there, um, you know, it's it's. Unfortunately, the perks that they used to have, the free parking at the airport, free parking at meters and municipal and state lots, that all came to the, an end on June 30. Um, but you know, um, even though the number of EV vehicles are growing in the islands, actually surprisingly, they grew uh, during the time of the pandemic. From March until now, the numbers are on the rise. But even then, we're all, it's only about 1% of all the vehicles here. So. <laughs> I think those incentives were were really important. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we take you, you, we don't have um, a state tax credit. Um, I'm not sure how long the federal credit has lasted or it will last. Um, and uh, I love dogs, by the way. I want to be, I want to be clear about that. <laughs> I, I guess you do too. Uh, um, I love them. And and so you know what what are we doing to incentivize? I mean, I think this is like a, it's one of those cars where you turn off the gas and it keeps on going, but how long is it going to go? It's not going to go that long. Um, so yeah, we may have some uh, increase uh, in you know electric vehicles on the road, but still, as you say, it's one percent. Uh, is the state doing what it can do? I mean, we seem to be diminishing our incentives, not increasing them. What message are we sending by having zero incentives now? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we, we did kind of have an informal reader poll and it, it did seem as if most of the people felt that, that those perks should end. So there's always sort of this, maybe this sort of a resentment, oh, you've got an EV and you get to park for free, you know, and, and but you know, maybe there needs to be a better understanding and there needs to be um, more accessibility as well as more incentives for, for people to uh, invest in the EVs because we're all trying to reach our goal, right? Of 100% renewables by 2045. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I myself was on the market for an EV. Um, Although, you know, of course, right now, most people, we're not driving a whole lot. And, and that's the other side of this. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there, you know, those incentives should, should, should be looked at again. And, you know, they could have been in a different form, maybe. You yeah, know. Well, it's, about, it's about leadership, isn't it? You know, I, I have to say that I have to admit, I will admit that my wife and I watch more television now than we used to watch. And on television, you know, on every channel on cable, which we pay for, we get ads, okay? We get tons of ads. And there are only two kinds of ads. I'll tell you what they are. One is for all the medicines. You get prescription drugs you never heard of, which are probably very expensive, which you're supposed to tell your doctor about. Um, that's one kind. And the other kind is car ads. Tons and tons and tons of car ads. And guess what? No electric vehicle car ads, zero zip. And I, you know, I mean, what kind of message is that? Um, we're not getting any strong signal, any signal at all from government or for that matter from the dealerships saying we should buy this. We're getting it from you. We're getting it from Mitch. He likes hydrogen cars. Uh, <laughs> but we're not. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'll get there, How many hydrogen cars are there in the state? Uh, not very many, probably about 10 or 15 or so uh, through uh, Servco with a Mirai, which is an awesome car. And they support it. They have their own hydrogen station there. And uh, the you know, lease fee is pretty reasonable. And it includes uh, all your hydrogen for 12,000 miles a year. So I don't want to give out any numbers in case I'm not giving you the right information. But Speaking yeah, of so Servco, by limited. the way. Speaking we, of Servco, there were two articles uh, that came around on the Star Advertiser newsfeed today. 
One was, was a star advertiser? I think so. Uh, one was that uh, there was a, a rumor that, uh, that Servco sold a substantial piece of property to Amazon. And the second was, yes, it actually did. It was not a rumor, it was serious, but the price was not disclosed. The, the takeaway, of course, is that we're gonna have Amazon right here in probably in a big warehouse processing facility right here yeah. in, the right. Middle of, in the middle of the city. That's news, that's important. Anyway, um, so you, you have any you have any comment on that you know, about the messaging? Uh, what what can we do specifically? Shouldn't the governor be saying something? Well, uh, you know, I, I think that they could do a little bit more. I do understand that right now the pandemic and uh, coronavirus seems to be at the forefront, you know, as well as travel. But you know, it could be part of the conversation, uh, especially about how we're you know, how, how we can rethink our economy, how, uh, you know, tourism, it's a very tourism driven economy. And obviously that has hurt a lot of people here, um, you know, more than 240,000 filing for unemployment. So, you know, we, it, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it might be part of the conversation about what can we do to reshape our revitalized economy. And maybe the energy part of the puzzle could play a, a role in that. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, we're in a time of reimagining our lives and now COVID has affected everything. And when we come out the other side, like it or not, our lives are going to be different. So we might as well think about all these things and bundle them together because at the, at the other side of the tunnel, it's not going to be just uh, COVID. It'll be everything. All of those deferred issues, we're going to have to deal with them, including energy. Uh, so I want to I want to sort of uh, get off the box for a minute and let uh, Mitch ask you some questions about energy uh, in the general context. He's probably going to ask you about hydrogen too. Yeah. Oh, maybe not that. <laughs> I don't want to be. Uh, yeah, but uh, Nina. So you know, you're out and about. You're interviewing people on energy. Um, what's the feeling you get about how important is energy to people, or do they just accept it as like, oh yeah, if I turn on the light, there's no big deal. You know, it's not really front and center in, in their lives. How important is energy actually to our local uh, citizens? Do you think? I think I think it, it becomes important once it becomes personal, once it hits you in your pocketbook. So, with everybody staying at home right now, or staying at home a lot more, uh, a lot of people working from home and soon learning from home. I think people are going to. People are going to care once it once they see their electricity bills and once it hits their pocketbook. Uh, I think that that does matter a lot. Fortunately, Hawaiian Electric is not you know is suspending any disconnections for the time being, so that nobody gets left in their home without electricity. But I, I think that uh, people will you know start to care once they see an electricity bill go up. Um, for those who have solar. It, you know, it's it's definitely going to help, uh, especially right now because it's hot and you know everybody kind of needs the AC. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just as a follow up question on that, so how important is renewable energy? Like we have these goals to be totally decarbonized by twenty forty five. Uh, in your going around talking to people once again, is that is that an issue for them? Do they even care about? It? Is that is that a driver for them? or as long as I can turn on the lights and drive their car, whatever. How do they feel about renewable energy and, and decarbonizing our economy? Once again, I, I think it, it's something that becomes more personal once it, it affects you somehow. Um, I think there's a small segment of the you know, people who, of course, they're, they're really into uh, getting off of fossil fuels. They're, they're concerned about climate change and they're concerned for the future generations, but that's only a very, very small percentage, I think, of the population. I think for most people, maybe sitting at the kitchen table, the conversation might be, yeah, are, are the hurricane storms going to be worse this year? Uh, is it something I need to worry about? Are, are the trade winds, you know, the, the trade winds go, gonna be uh, impacted um, in, in the long term or over, over the long term, and those are the kinds of things that I think will matter to people. At you know, or it might be like, oh, if you if you can afford a solar PV system and your own storage, you could really lower your your electricity bill, and it it could really really help you out. Right. Things that are I think more personal, but I think as far as the overall conversation on climate change, 
um, it's really a really small percentage. And I think even some of the folks that are buying electrical vehicles, it's it's because they want to save uh, save money and they they don't want to have to keep on buying gas. Because even though gas prices are going down, we still have the highest prices here. I think compared to other places on the mainland. So I think things like that that are are more at a personal level could probably. Um, matter and then you and then maybe there's more of a conversation about what does this mean what is renewable energy and well why does that matter you know over the long term and why does it matter for a place like Hawaii uh, you know where we have to import everything and you know where we have to rely so much on fuel imported here so this, this just raises a, a whole a whole array of questions that go beyond energy and and actually more more into COVID, I want to cover, and that and that is this. You know, the people around the table who are waiting for lower gas prices, um, or lower electric bills, uh, they're in it for themselves. That's their personal issue, as you say. It touches them and their pocketbook personally. And and the same thing with with COVID. The, you know, people are touched by wearing a mask may help them stay alive. Um, social distancing may keep them away uh, from the um, you know, the, the, the infection. And so uh, this is a dichotomy between what saves me, what is in my personal and my family's interest, and what saves the community. Um, because uh, in both of these cases, energy and COVID, there's this dichotomy. So I wanna, I wanna move a little to that and ask you about, you know, how people are feeling about the community concerns over COVID. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we've had good messaging on that one either, and I think people are really touched by it when they're scared of dying. Um, but the question is, are they concerned about the community in general? Are they doing social distancing uh, to pr protect themselves, or are they doing social distancing to protect others? And how can we fix that? I think it's a great parallel. Just like you said, it's, 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 uh, it's a long-term long-term problem and issue and it's not going to go away all on its own it's going to be there and it's something that we need to address over a long term uh, i think as the governor often likes to say it's a marathon not a sprint uh, so i think that um, there are a lot of parallels there and, and like i said uh, i think on a large scale yeah you know, of course everybody's going to say yes you know my spirit of aloha i, I want to wear that mask so that i can you know um protect my community and everything, but it, it's maybe not gonna hit as close to home as your friend just got you know, tested positive or your, somebody in your family tested positive and actually went through this, this whole scary experience. Uh, of course, yes, everybody is, is concerned about it, but I think it doesn't really hit home until somebody you know, and I think though, there was a, a survey recently, and, and there is a, a pretty big percentage of, of folks that know someone or know someone that knows somebody who tested positive. Uh, and so maybe that's when it really hits home. But yes, you're right. I think the messaging should have been there in the beginning, and it needed to be consistent, and it needed to be um, really specific. I mean, maybe very specific in situations like, well, if you are going to have a gathering of 10, at your house, you still want to practice social distancing because you're 10 people representing, you know, maybe 10 different households and exposure to different places. Uh, unfortunately, the CDC, they, they weren't consistent about the face masks from the very beginning. Uh, you know, initially they said, we don't, we don't need, need to have that. And I think the key part of that was that you know, you, apparently now they say that, you know, there are a lot of people who, who are asymptomatic that are infected. And now, you know, we've come out and, you know, that's very clear. Uh, but, you know, if they had said that from the beginning, maybe it would have helped. And uh, like you yeah. said, that could be the same too with our, our initiative for clean energy as well. If, if, you know, from the very beginning, we've set out our goals and, and outlined exactly what the steps are to get them. You know, well, there, there are pictures. Question. Go ahead. Follow-up question. So, you know, you see these stories of all the, the uh, younger community going to beach parties and bars and not giving two rats about any of this stuff. So my question is getting back to the basics. 
are we teaching our children in our schools and at home, but let's look at the school, about personal responsibility and their personal ethics? Or is that, is that a gap? And it, it applies to both the energy side and to the health side. So like, are we providing them with a fundamental education? Like they do in Japan, I understand, like the first three years of their schooling, they learn about personal responsibility and taking care of each other rather than just me, 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 me. So are we getting the right messages across? I think some, t I think some, some are and, and some aren't, but of course, you know, some, some people are just struggling right now and, and we do need to remember that they're just struggling to get by, um, you know, doing their best or, or even, um, you know, trying to get food on the table. So uh, some are and some aren't. I, I have seen some youth who, who've taken a lot of initiative and who do care a lot, uh, both about this pandemic as well as about climate change. So, you know, we've seen, leaders, a lot of young leaders here in Hawaii as well, who, you know, uh, spearheaded movements and uh, some rallies. And so I, I think that some are and some aren't, and maybe, you know, we need to um, integrate that into our education system. I mean, and I think there are some efforts to do that, but we have to remember too, that we need to, to, to work harder for those that are disadvantaged and, and just struggling to get by right now. Mm -hmm. You know, you've written about um, in the, the I, I'm not sure the right word, the event uh, most recently uh, on Kalakaua Avenue in Waikiki and other events where young people go, I guess it's mostly young people, but not only young people. And they go um, in, a, in a spirit of enthusiasm, but they don't wear masks and they're huddled together, which is nice for social engagement, but not so good uh, for a pandemic. And actually, it reminds me of Tulsa. It reminds me of some of those gatherings in Florida, um, Fort Lauderdale and other places. It re reminds me of some of those other gatherings in the South, uh, which, you know, where people were influenced by Trump and, you know, they, uh, they were trying to reopen at an early time. And uh, everybody gets together and they all infect each other. I mean, it, we looked at this. I mean, I'm sure we all looked at this a month ago and said, whoa, we're going to be in for it, all those people breathing in each other. And sure enough, it's happened. And so the question is, the people on Kalakaua right here in Hawaii, who should know better, why don't they wear masks? So I, I think I think maybe, um, so of course, I think you're talking about the Kalakaua Open Street events in Waikiki, where they, they uh, just limited the street to let people stroll and bike on it. So on one hand, that's, uh, for climate change, that's that's a great thing because we're encouraging more people to, to walk and bike and to get away from the cars. And here during this pandemic, there's a great opportunity to do that. So yes, that on one hand is a, a great opportunity. Um, on the other hand, maybe uh, there should be more caution about um, wearing the mask when there are so many people. Uh, uh, so I was, I have not actually been to one of those events. Um, I love biking, uh, but I just bike around my own neighborhood. So, you know, but I, it did sound like an innovative program. So maybe the messaging there should have been where if there is going to be a crowd and you think you're going to be in close proximity to others that are outside of your household, then you might want to try to put on a mask. However, there's some confusion. There's a lot of confusion over the fast face mask mandate. Um, Apparently, you don't have to wear it when you're doing outdoor exercise activities. So if you're out jogging, running, hiking, walking the dog, you don't have to wear one. And so uh, I think, you know, in general, because it's an outside activity, that bike activity was, you know, is supposed to be safe. However, if too many people are in close proximity, then they should, they should be, you know, have the messaging and be wearing the mask. Of just just for safety as well, and maybe maybe just for safety's sake. And so at, at that at that pace, you probably will want to just do a leisurely ride, and you know you won't be going very fast. But I, I think with that many people there, uh, people probably won't be going that fast. So maybe it would be a good idea for more of those people to just wear a mask, you know, to be on the safe side if they want to participate in something like that. So you know, and so it's been interesting because I've seen a couple different stories out there about the protests. 
uh, for Black Lives Matter that occurred a while ago. And, and there was a lot of criticism about that. Um, but I think there have been some stories that have come out that said, you know what, surprisingly, there were not a lot of positive cases that came out of that because people were wearing their masks. And so that was really one key part of it is uh, how careful people are in when they participate in a group activity like that, um, how well they practice physical distancing, how well they, they practice the mask wearing, but the mask wearing apparently is one of the, the real keys to helping to reduce the spread of this respiratory uh, disease, so. Yeah, Mitch, you had something? I just had a new, I got helicopters and planes flying overhead here. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, about the fossil fuel industry. So we've talked about renewables and, uh, you know, clean energy and electric vehicles. You know, what's your view of the fossil fuel industry here in Hawaii, particularly our refineries and also Hawaii gas. So Hawaii gas has been mandated to decarbonize. That's not going to be a very easy thing to do for them. So because they sell SNG, so apparently the only uh, alternative really is uh, re either renewable gas, which still has carbon in it, or hydrogen over my right shoulder there. Um, so, uh, and aircraft are still going to be using, you know, ab gas for quite a long time. I mean, they all run on gas turbines. So what, what are your thoughts or have you, have you had, done any stories on the, what's going on with our fossil fuel industry here in Hawaii? I mean, the gas question, it's going to be, it's, it's a difficult conversation, but it's probably a conversation that, that needs to be had, um, and it's not easy. Uh, as far as fossil fuels, yes. Um, I mean, if we are going to, uh, if we are going to aim towards our 100% renewable goals, then we do, we do need to um, look at renewables. And I think if you saw recently, we had a story about a, a major project of, of some solar farm proposals. I believe it was, uh, oh, it was, it was about, it was uh, 12 different projects uh, that would uh, cover more than 3,000 acres on three different islands here. So that's huge. That's, that's a significant um, generation. But however, it's, it's not that simple because, um, you know, you need to have community engagement. You need to have uh, public input on where those those sites are. And as if you've seen, um, you know, some of our wind farms ended up being really controversial and, and those ended up being scrapped. So, um, I mean, I think that we've, we've already set our goal uh, for renewable energy, but it's gonna take a while to get there and, and we need to look at some of these alternatives. Hmm. Yeah. You, know, you know, this is all, this is all very, it, it comes together. I'll tell you why I, I think that is we're in a crisis and uh, we're, we're remaking ourselves and we'd better do that because in every day we have 29, 30, 40 cases and uh, our numbers are going up uh, as they are on the mainland. Our supply lines are being stretched, stretched. I think people right now, they have the comfort of going down a safe way and being able to buy food or lungs and buy medicine that may not last forever. You, you know that if you follow the economy, it's declining in the state. Uh, you know, the, we, we spoke with uh, Allison Schaefer, so it's not great in tourism right now. And nobody knows when we come out the other side. And so it's a time to be introspective as a community. It's a time to, th to think about how we can do better on COVID and follow the rules and get, you know, good, good standards in place. But it's also a time to think about all those other issues. I mean, for example, we need to reduce the cost of energy. And, and in effect, you know, my information is we are. There are things in the pipeline now that will reduce the cost of energy in the state, including hydrogen. Um, and so, you know, the thing about it is that this is a time when you want the government to look at policy. Um, you, you're ready for new ideas, new reimaginations. But the legislature didn't, may I say this, I, you know, I, maybe you have a different view, I'd like to hear it. Legislature really didn't do anything this year on any of the issues that we, that we follow. Maybe they did something on issues you follow. Um, but I think the legislature really left it in the road. Um, and we need to get our act together in terms of reimagining things, of handling you know, climate change, um, all other environmental issues, energy issues, and, and of course, COVID and public health. 
Are we doing what we can do to get through the tunnel here? We could always do more. We could always do more. We could always uh, try harder, of course. But uh, I point out, I just got an email today. Uh, the Blue Planet Foundation just came out with a waypoints report, and it, it was outlining all the ways that you know we could rethink our economy, the ways we could find new sources of revenue um, while addressing climate change. I think the University of Hawaii also has some projects and initiatives in the works. Uh, so, you know, there are some, some efforts underway. And I think uh, this, this, this year's legislative session, of course, happened really quickly. And of course, once again, probably had to focus mostly on the pandemic and, and just shoring up. Um, but I, I think that they did pass a bill uh, that was looking at the energy efficiency of state buildings. So that's a good start. That's really a good start. Uh, you know, I mean, if anything, we can start with the state buildings, the government buildings, and then we can, you know, look at the uh, the electrification of, of government fleet, which is which is in the way is in the works. Uh, and then after that, you know, of course, then it, it becomes a personal decision. Um, and then I, I think just like with the pandemic, you need to get buy-in from the public, buy-in from the, the community. I'd, I'd be curious, um, are you guys, have you guys invested in solar yourselves? Um, myself, no, except my time on trying to cover it. Uh, what about you, Mitch? Uh, no, I'm a renter, <laughs> but my landlord, my current landlord has invested heavily in solar and uh, hot, solar hot water heating which is awesome because it's like almost instant on. So I, I like it. Yeah. So. And you know yeah. that uh, solar is up 40% this year. We had a show about that a couple of days ago. So I, I don't fully understand it if you want to know, but people are, they're, they're finding the money, they're finding financing arrangements that allow them to do it and they're doing it. And the solar industry is actually going great guns. <laughs> don't, don't, don't ask me why, but that's what's happening. Um, so maybe, oh. you know, maybe there's hope in Mudville uh, you know, on that one, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the, the other thing that bothers me is that I, I would like to see, I would like to see more public conversation on these issues, the issues we've been talking about. And you're a reporter, so you, you know about public conversation. You're engaged in it every day. But in fact, I, I believe that a reporter is different than an ordinary human being uh, in the sense that when you walk down the street, you're actually engaging with everything around you. You're watching and listening and trying to get the smell of the flowers or not um, all around you. And so I'm, I'm concerned about not only here, but elsewhere, um, you know, the decline of, of, of local print press, uh, the decline of local journalism. Um, and that's why I'm so delighted to have you on the show because, you know, we're, we're kind of related in a, in a funny way, Nina. So how do you think about that? How do you think about journalism, you know, as a career for young people? As a, as a life experience, as, a, as, a, as an engagement with community and, and with democracy. How do you feel about that? I, I think that, we, I think that uh, they, we still play a vital role, uh, whether it's in print form, online, or you know, through, through whatever medium there is going to be for the future. And you know, I, I'm not kidding myself about it. Uh, the new generation, um, you know, my 10 year old, he probably is going to read the news online versus, you know, flipping through a paper. I still have a few neighbors here who tell me they still prefer to do that and that they want to, to, to flip through it and they want to see the crossword and they want to see the comments. Uh, but I think regardless of whatever medium it's in, uh, you know, journalists still play that role of, of uh, engaging with the community, um, you know, digging out the information and asking the questions that need to be asked. Of course, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's very um, challenging when you're, um, you know, you have so much going on and, and you can only do so much from day to day that you don't have time to, to dig into something as much as you would like to if you had more time. But let me ask you guys, what are some stories you guys would like to see relating to energy? Or the pandemic. What are some stories that you you would you would like to see? Uh, if, if you're addressing it to me, Mitch can answer it also. Um, I want to know how government is working or not working. You know, I see those young kids not fully understanding the need to feel that they are part of government and government is part of them. I want to see the social fabric reconnected. 
I want everyone to vote, of course. I want everyone to have opinions about government um, and about how we have, we have to live together and solve public policy issues together. And um, if, if you ask me what the most important thing is, it's covering government and it's calling out um, and making political officials accountable. Very critically important, especially uh, right now with what is going on in Washington. That would be my, my priority. But of course, we like technology. Uh, we like science. Uh, we like progressive you know, development of the community and, and the environment. Um, and of course, um, uh, we, like, uh, we like global awareness because we think that Hawaii has to be connected to other places. Mitch, what's your answer to the question? Well, first of all, I love hydrogen because I think it's the, the ultimate alternative, but it's gonna take a long time to transition out. But I'd also like to see, uh, you know, looking at the new, the new format of the Hawaii State Energy Office, you know, I, I think the legislature actually did a really good thing by carving them off as a separate entity with a really good leader, you know, uh, in charge of it and with a clear mandate on what they have to do. And I'm very, very encouraged by Scott Glenn and how he's handling it. And I think there's lots of stories there for, for yourself uh, positive stories on what we're doing to change the uh, energy system here in Hawaii, because they're make, they're really helping making it happen. So those would be my two interests. A lot of what they do, I, I think a lot of what they do is, is sort of a mystery, right? I mean, maybe yeah. it's really not a household thing. Everybody says, oh, the state energy office, <laughs> right? They, nobody kind of knows what they're doing. So yeah. all right. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new organization, a whole new mandate, and uh, they, really, they really got the, uh, you know, a plan on how to get us transitioned over. So I think it's something that we need to get that out into the community to educate them on what we're actually doing in positive ways. It's just like you said, some amorphous group that nobody knows about. But, you know, we have, some real, uh, we have some real traction now in the energy industry. I'm really happy to see that. And, and as, kudos, as I kudos you know, to the uh, the legislators for getting that done. I'm not, you know, they, they really made a, a good informed decision on that. So that's it. I got my brownie points, but it really is a thrill to be asked by a reporter a question like that. And I, I just want to add that per our conversation before the show began, um, it would be great to have an article about the status of testing, the technology of testing, the reason it takes so long. Uh, the reason that the reason it takes so long in view of the fact that there are people all over the world working and successfully working on fast tests, five or 10 minute tests, we don't have them. And finally, as I mentioned before the show, I would really like an article um, talking about the software uh, that makes testing work. You can have testing, but for a community, uh, a community um, um, solution on this, you really have to have, you know, software. Where is the software? Uh, where is the you know, software that applies everywhere? Uh, how can we bring ourselves together in, in beating this with testing and, and tracing? So uh, I don't think the public knows enough about that. Anyway, Nina, it's been wonderful to have you on here and to have this freewheeling conversation with you. I sure enjoy that. It's like a great, a, a great um, way to spend the day, honestly. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Nina Wu, the star advertiser. And thank you, Mitch, Mitch I really appreciate you coming around. And we'll do this again soon. How about next week? We'll do it next week. Oh, and Nina, good. Nina, we're gonna we're gonna catch up with you later and we're gonna circle back and see what you're doing and writing about, okay? I follow, Bonnie. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. You. Aloha.